Hi, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to the uh, first session of the Organic Landscaping Series uh, for the spring of 2023. We have great speakers um, at all of four sessions. And um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview. And then I'm going to introduce the speaker tonight. Uh, and um, I welcome you uh, to please uh, participate in all of them. If you can't be here for one of them, we're recording all of them. And they're going to be on the website uh, for the Watertown Free Public Library, I believe, on their YouTube channel. So uh, without further ado, uh, these, um, the seminars uh, that, that we're going to be showing are going to be um, uh, or the speaker series. We're going to first start, start tonight on um, March 16th, 2023, with Jim Agabetis from Minuteman Landscaping next month. Uh, and they're always going to be on the third Thursday of the month at 7 o'clock, and we'll go to about 8.30. Um, this uh, next month, April on April 20th, Denise Bruckenrecker is, is uh, going to be speaking. She's from the Mass Water Resources Authority. Uh, in May, on May 18th, Sarah Evans, uh, who is a PhD, MPH, an assistant professor uh, uh, from the Environmental Medicine and Public Health from the Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in, um, in New York, uh, in uh, New York City in New York is going to be speaking. And the last speaker of the series uh, is going to be uh, in June, on June 15th, and Chip Osborne, uh, and he's going to be uh, talking, he's an organic landscaper, and he's going to be talking about uh, what was done in Wellesley to make it um, you know, all organic. Uh, and he's just, he's a great speaker. He's also on the board of Beyond Pesticides, which is an organization out of Washington, D.C. Tonight, we have a real treat. We have Jim Agabetis from Minuteman Landscaping. He's going to start the series off and de defining what is organic landscaping, and also uh, what are the what are, are the associated costs and what you, can you do at your home. Uh, and um, without further ado, I'm going to bring in uh, Jim Agabetis, and he's uh, he's going to start showing his slides and and sharing the wealth of his knowledge um, that he has for uh, to all of us. So, Jim, thank you, Deb. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening and participating. Um, it's a privilege to share some of the things that we've been doing over these past, I guess, 39 years of doing organic gardening and landscaping. Um, this topic tonight, I'm going to try to address it in a, in a little different way. It's going to be how does natural organic work, but I'm going to take it from the perspective as if you were to hire a contractor or if you were to try to do it yourself. So you can kind of apply it any way that it makes sense for you. So, you know, if you're going to do a natural organic program, it really needs to start with a visit to the site. So if you hire a contractor, they need to come out and look at it. If it's your own property, you need to walk around and have a look, see. And um, I feel like there's a couple of different things you want to do when you get there. And just to simplify it, you know, the eyeball test is when we, you know, we walk around, we see what's going on. We want to test for compaction. We want to do a soil test for the soil chemistry, and we want to do a soil biology test. This is the proper way to do it. You don't have to do it this way, but all of these pieces really um, allow you to get um, a good, good idea as to what's going on in the garden and what's the most effective way to approach it. So um, as, as we go down here to this third slide, this eyeball test that we're talking about, if you look at the slide on the left, you're going to see a variety of weeds there. We've got some clover, some plantain, looks like some chickweed in there and, and a size 10 and a half shoe, which belongs to me, but that's a different thing. That's not a weed. Uh, what's gonna happen here is when you see that, these, these weeds are indicators. So if you look at the list on the right, these are all the common weed conditions that produce weeds. And I'll give you some examples. Um, if we see a lot of chickweed in our gardens, we're typically mowing too short. A lot of exposure to sunlight creates chickweed. These are things we can avoid without using chemicals. So this is the, the point is, is that we can do a lot of this without actually using the harsh chemicals and reduce some of these, these weeds. Another one would be crabgrass. We see lots of crabgrass everywhere. So it's, it's usually dry conditions, sloped areas, areas that abut paved areas where the heat and the radiant heat from say a driveway or a walkway dry out the edges of a lawn. That's uh, something we can avoid by either watering a little differently, maybe extending our watering over the walkway a little bit, 
or watering more judiciously. Nutsedge is another common weed that we see and that's a poor drainage. So when we have poor drainage and we have an aerated and we don't have uh, good soil drainage, we're gonna see um, things like nutsedge thrive. And so we can avoid that. Clover is another one. Clover is a sign of low nitrogen. So you can see where I'm going with this. Plantain, moist conditions, we're mowing too low and compaction. So when we look at these things, uh, that's what our eyeball test is going to do. It's going to start to evaluate what's going on, and we're going to start to come up with a plan as to what we can change to get this to work properly. There's other things we want to look at too, like light conditions. You know, when we're up against a shady lawn or a sunny lawn, it's going to lend itself to a different strategy, right? If we have a lot of sun, we may plant a different kind of grass. We may um, not use grass at all in that area. If we have a lot of shade, we know it's going to constantly thin out. These are things you need to pay attention to. The other one is, is the terrain. Is it hilly? Is it sloped? Uh, do we have depressions? If it's sloped, it tends to be dry because it doesn't hold water. If we have depressions, it's going to tend to be wet and boggy where the water sits for an extended period of time. Rocky soils and root infested soils tend to be compact. And that's where you're going to find your challenges. You'll be trying to reseed those areas over and over again with very little success because of those conditions. Then we're going to look at our compaction test. That's sort of the next one. We use a like a simple meter, a compaction meter. It's called a penetrometer. It's a very simple device. It's a probe that tells us how compact the soil is. So I'd say with a, with a natural organic program, we don't want to be guessing. Yeah, it would be kind of like our physician looking at us at a doctor's appointment and just telling us to turn around a few times and then recommending some sort of treatment. It's, it's, it's not accurate. And so we wanna be as accurate as we can be. You, can, you don't have to purchase a sophisticated tool like this, but you can tell when things are compact when you go to put a shovel in the ground or if, you're, um, if you've got a pitchfork and things like that, you can get an idea how compact things are on a residential level as well. And if you hire a contractor, ask them to do a compaction test so that you know you really need aeration or you don't. It's gonna make a big difference. And um, I guess the, the acceptable PSI on this here is the green area. So between one and 200 is really a very good PSI for growing grass. And it, you know anything over that's gonna make it more challenging. But tight compacted soils allow weeds to thrive and the root system of our lawns remain shallow. And um, when we do that, they're very susceptible to drought and heat. So a lot of times we'll see after a difficult summer or during a drought like we had last year, you're gonna see your turf kind of wither away and you're gonna be like, what happened? I mean, turf is supposed to go dormant and turn brown. And that's what our you know, cool season grasses do to sustain themselves, but they're not supposed to become bare spots. They're supposed to hold their, their turf and hold their ground, so to speak, and then come back in the fall. So if we see that, that's because we have shallow rooted grass that can't withstand the soil temperatures going up as high as they are. Um, we like to do our aeration in the fall. And a lot of people will say to me, well, why do you do it in the fall? Well, if we do it in the spring and you can, it's, there's no hard and fast rule not to, but when we do, we're poking holes, we're coring holes in, in the turf when the weeds are most active. And so when we do that, we're really inviting uh, more of a weed issue uh, than we want to. And just keep in mind as we're talking, with a natural organic program, um, things are slow to respond. So we wanna be proactive. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. But the reason why I mention that is we wanna be ahead of the curve. We don't want to um, have things creep in and then have a major project of removing it. Now, I, I realize that many, many people have different expectations. To, to one person, a lawn is mostly weeds, and to another, it's perfect turf, and there's everything in between. Your personal taste and your expectations will be your own, but I do say keep in mind that as we go more towards a full weed situation, we tend to have big bare spots coming out of winter because the weeds are annual for the most part, and you're gonna have a lot of erosion and you're gonna have soil moving around and those aren't good things. So you want some sort of turf mixed in to kind of hold the erosion issue and hold that in place. Um, fall is also the best time to aerate because 
as the weeds aren't thriving, it's a great time to overseed and it's a great time to add any soil amendments or some of the, what we would call soil test recommendations. This is the time to get it in the soil while we're coring holes in the ground. And now we've got a two inch core that's probably, I don't know, a half an inch in diameter. And we're, we're putting good nutritious material in and it's already two inches below the surface right from the start. So it's actually getting to the root level very quickly. Um, core aeration itself uh, is it's highlighted in this video. The machine in the front is a core aerator. I, I, love, I love the idea of core aerating when it's needed, after measuring and when it's needed, because it's doing all those good things and giving us healthy, deep roots, allowing oxygenation to happen, getting oxygen to the roots and those things. So as we have these organic programs, if you're a homeowner, you might say, I don't have the luxury of owning an aerator. And, and that's understandable. But you can rent those from Taylor Rental or some of the local rental places. You could even hire someone to do that portion of the project for you while you do the mowing and the fertilizing and the other things. But it is something to, um, I, would, I would incorporate it, uh, aeration into your regular uh, program if, you, if at all possible. Uh, the other thing, when I go to a property to look at things, I always evaluate the water um, situation. I assess it. You know, do, does that family have irrigation? Do you have irrigation? Do you have to hand water? Do you have a spigot that's handy for where you're working? Um, is there, is there um, someone available to water in case you vacation on the Cape all summer? There's all kinds of considerations, and you should be figuring those things out as you try to uh, assess what you're going to do for, for a lawn. And just, just remember this too. I know um, organic lawns um, are, are really, I think, special because they use less water. And, and so as we're talking about water and the water resource, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, um, an organic program is going to hold moisture in the soil profile much longer. So that's going to be a good thing. The other thing I pay attention to, and, and you as a homeowner or someone going to hire someone, is mowing practices. You know, the cultural practice of mowing uh, can either make or break an organic, a natural organic program. And um, mowing too short is one of the biggest um, problems we have. If you think of a blade of grass um, uh, as sort of a, a mechanism of protecting the soil, it's almost like a canopy of shade that keeps our soil temperatures cool. And so um, the, taller, the taller grass plants end up shading and keeping things cooler because in, in the uh, sort of the spectrum of how weeds actually appear, it's all related to soil temperature. And so once soil temperature hits about 55 degrees, that's when we see most of those summer weeds start coming in. Now, if you pay attention, Typically in April and May, you won't see a lot of weeds. And actually the lawn looks really good in May after it's been mown a few times, mostly grass, very green and lush, very healthy. And then as soon as the warm weather comes, the bare spots that maybe have been left behind from the previous fall get inundated with the weed seed that's already in the soil. It's already there waiting to germinate. And when it does, that's what infills those bare spots. Um, Taller grass is also more disease and insect resistant. And that's a, that's a big part of what, why we're keeping the grass high. And then also, um, you know, I, I neglected to tell you the height. You sh we should be leaving the grass at three and a half to four inches uh, tall. And that's for our cool season grasses here in New England. Um, it's gonna shade out shade loving weeds, uh, sun loving weeds. It's, lots of these weeds are activated by sunlight. So if we keep the grass high, we tend to discourage them from coming in. Uh, taller grasses are more drought tolerant. I love that part of it because mo almost all the nutrients, all the strength of the blade of grass in the summer months, in the growing season, are stored just in the blade of grass. Very little to do with the root system at that point. The roots kind of kick in in the fall a little bit more. So that's important too. And just also think of it as, as the, the bigger the blade of grass, the taller it is, the more photosynthesis it can take. And photosynthesis is gonna result in a, a healthier and a deeper root system and just a healthier plant, whatever you're trying to grow, uh, whatever type of grass you're trying to grow. 
there's, there's some additional pointers I wanted to mention in, in regards to mowing. And that's, um, if you're a homeowner, sharpening your blades um, can be a nuisance, but it's very, very important. I highly recommend before the season starts to have your mower blades sharpened so that uh, we're not uh, introducing insect and disease issues through tearing of the grass instead of cutting it cleanly. And one, one of the tricks of the trade is to always clear the lawn before you um, go to mow. I know it's an extra step, but if you went around with a small you know, bag or, or a barrel and picked up branches and debris that the blade doesn't have to come up against, it'll keep those blades sharp for most of the year, if not the whole year. And uh, that's a good thing to do. If you have a riding mower or if you have a contractor, you should be asking some questions. Um, we have to check air pressure in pneumatic tires because if the, if the air pressure isn't right, those tires are lower. Therefore, we're not cutting at three and a half now. We're cutting at three or, or two and three quarters and uh, we're injuring uh, and, and sort of uh, halting the progress of an organic program. I like to leave the clippings uh, as often as I can. There are times when we would pick up clippings. Um, there's sort of this, um, there's a time of year when we have some debris on the lawn like leaves in the fall and you wanna gather them up, that's fine. But just think of it this way, when we pick up clippings, we're picking up about 70% of the fertilizer we're putting down because all that stored energy is at the top. And every time we cut the grass, we're pulling away the good, the good material that we're putting down to, to, to you know, give our plants a, a healthy start. The other thing is mowing frequency. Um, I, you know, a lot of people say they don't like to mow too much. They, they don't wanna mow. Some people mow twice a week. I feel like you need to mow so that you're leaving, um, you know, the three and a half to four inches, but you shouldn't be cutting like half the plant. It should be more like a third of the plant. So we're not stressing it out. And the other thing about that is, is that when you do mow frequently, not too often, but just frequently once a week, once every 10 days, whatever it is, you're actually cutting the seed heads off of a lot of the weeds so that the weeds aren't overtaking. Now, I should probably stop here and just say that there are some weeds that people want and, and we're not trying to discourage that. It, every, every homeowner has a different preference. So if you like dandelions or if you like clover, these are, these are okay in an organic garden. You know what you're getting when you do that. And you can, leave, you can leave it a little longer and let those seeds sort of you know, propagate as, as they need to. But just keep in mind, if you're trying to keep I like to keep my turf at about 70% of my lawn, 30% weeds, 70% turf because of that winter issue that I was telling you about where we have a lot of erosion. If you have pets or kids in the winter and it's, there's no snow on the ground, they're tracking a lot of mud in the yard. Uh, we're also depositing all kinds of silt and material in our drain systems, which goes somewhere down the line and does some polluting in its own way. So we want to be careful of that and sensible about that. Um, these are common sense things, but you do want to use the right machine for the job. If you have a contractor, um, a lot of times they want to use these excessively large and heavy machines in small areas, uh, lots of heavy uh, twisting and turning and dislodging of grass. You may want to mention something about that and, um, and have, uh, they have different size mowers. We have different size mowers. You have 21 inch mowers, you know, 30 inch mowers, 42 inch mowers, 52 inch mowers. You just wanna use the right machine for the right uh, job. And if you do have a contract or you yourself, we highly recommend you don't mow in, in the rain or in wet conditions because it, it doesn't cut well. And um, I think you do some harm to the lawn. So you'd wanna wait for the lawn to dry out a little bit before you mow it. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit now about uh, soil chemistry and biology. This, these are the last two components to that second slide I showed you. Um, before I do that, I'll just highlight what grass that's cut at three and a half to four inches looks like in the fall. This is an organic lawn and one of our clients and um, it, we had just seeded maybe about two or three weeks ago and it's filling in. In the summer, it's got some weeds in it. In the fall, it looks like a golf course and not that we're trying to do that, but the turf is really thick and full and it seems to have uh, some good health to it, but it's maintained up high. You can see how high it is and how healthy it is. 
This is called a soil probe. Um, the reason why I'm showing you that is when, when you do a soil test, and you may not have a soil probe, most people don't, but if you're gonna take a soil test, you're gonna wanna use um, a tool and implement that doesn't have steel or iron, because when you do, that will skew the soil test. It'll make the iron component very high, you know, a little bit of rust or whatever is on a tool, it gets transferred into the soil sample and gives you a misleading result. So you wanna use either a stainless steel shovel or a trowel or um, a probe like this, they're not very expensive. And the thing that I recommend to people is um, that we that we want to do the same areas twice. So I would highly recommend using a probe like this. And then also when you do it, make a little diagram of the lawn and show where you sampled from. And so a good a good sampling is a random sample of multiple areas throughout your garden. The only exception is if you have areas in the yard that are either underperforming or overperforming, you want to differentiate big differences in your turf. So if you have one part of your yard that never grows grass well or just isn't thriving, the soil isn't thriving, I would do a separate test for areas that are drastically different so that you can address that differently and, and specifically. Um, when you do collect those samples, you wanna go down about three to five inches. That's kind of the root profile. You wanna kind of go where the roots live. Um, and then um, you wanna send it to a reliable lab. Um, so what we do is, um, I used to use UMass, they're terrific. Um, I've since found a couple of labs that do things a little more specifically for organic for me. Um, Spectrum Analytic in Ohio is a good one. And Waypoint Analytic is the one that I'm using now that I really love. It gives me some great information. A little later in the presentation, I'm gonna go over a soil test with you guys and I'll show you, I'll highlight some of the, the information that's really helpful uh, for an organic garden, a natural organic garden. Um, actually, we're gonna go right to those now. Um, and so um, you're gonna have a hard time reading these. I have hard copies here. So I just wanna highlight a few things. Uh, first, I wanna highlight the date at the top. So this is May 7th, 2019. I also wanna highlight the square footage, really important. If you're gonna do a soil test, you need to know the square footage so that you know how much material to put down. Everything is pounds per square foot. So you need to, need to have that conversion ready to go. And so this, this yard is almost uh, 17,500 square feet. And if you look at that next line, if you can read it, I'll read it to you. It says overall quality of this soil is poor. Now that's the lowest of all the different categories of quality and soil that we have. And I just wanna read something to you. This is what we get back from our lab. It says, this soil is, is exhibiting poor chemical characteristics, which will show signs of compaction, regardless of the, the amount of use. We're gonna have weed pressure, disease susceptibility, insect attraction, stress intolerance, um, Talk about having a bad day, right? I mean, that's not good. And then, so building good soil quality is it, it, because of our soil's poor conditions will take several years to become sustainable. That's the part that a lot of people uh, try to understand. So when you do get involved in a natural organic program, you're gonna have, um, this soil test is gonna tell you what your path is gonna be like. Is it gonna be a three-year plan, a one-year plan, a five-year plan? depending on the quality of your soil. And so it's good to know that. It's good to have, um, you know, a, a reliable, you know, starting point. This is, this is why it's so important to do that. But while we're doing that, I just want to go over a couple key, key elements on this test so that when you do get your soil test back, you'll, you'll know what to look for. So you're going to look at soil pH. That's this one, uh, the, the first item in the uh, results category. You're going to look at percent organic matter, and you're going to look at cation exchange. And I'm going to just take a couple minutes, and I'm just going to explain what those are, just so you have a reference point, and that you can uh, kind of understand where we're going with it. The soil pH, most people are familiar with it. It measures our acidity and alkalinity, and it's important because it affects how most of our nutrients are taken in by, by the grass plant itself. And it also impacts 
weed pressure or weed production. Organic matter is the percent of a plant and in, in uh, the plant and animal tissue in various stages of breakdown or decomposition. For example, lawn clippings, leaves, twigs, worms, algae, uh, microbes. These are just some of the things in our gardens that break down and become organic matter. Um, it's really what it was, is it's something that was alive that is now decomposed into organic matter. Very, very valuable. Holds a lot of moisture, helps us to retain um, our, um, our nutrients in, in the grow zone, as we call it, where it's growing. It's a holder, it's a retainer of water and nutrients long enough so the, the roots of the plant can take it in. Very, very important. Cation exchange is the one that a lot of people uh, have never heard of before. And it's, it's really, really important. And I'm gonna explain it as simply as I can. Um, simply put, it's a measure of how well our soil is able to hold on to nutrients and water. The more nutrients and water a soil particle can hold, the more efficient and effective those nutrients can be taken in and used up by the grass plant. So basically a healthier plant. Again, just like organic matter holds water and nutrients in a place, this makes that, um, because it's attaching to the particle, it's making it more effective and efficient. So we're getting the most effectiveness when we put down our fertilizer, 10% isn't being used, 100% is. So when we get our cation exchange right, we're being very effective in how we're taking in the fertilizers we're putting down. Um, so, um, so once we get our tests, we start to think about what's going on. So I just wanna go back to the soil test. We have soil tests for 2020. You can see April 14th. We didn't make much progress. And that's, and that's a lot of people ask me, well, why are we seeing progress? You have to remember, if we take a six inch profile of our soil and we have 10,000 square feet, we have tons and tons and tons of soil we need to change. We're not gonna change it with a 50 pound bag of lime. It has to be done over time. We would have to put down a hundred bags of lime and then it would look like it was winter in the summer. We can't do that. It's just not possible. So it takes like, you have to meter it out. For example, when I see my pH here, it's recommending and one application of high efficiency calcitic lime at five pounds per thousand square feet. That's where the measurement for our square foot comes in. Now we know that we're gonna need five, five pounds per thousand square feet so we don't burn the lawn, so we don't um, skew the uh, pH in, in the wrong direction and so that we can make the change. Going forward, we're gonna start to go now into 2021, starting to make small incremental changes in our cation exchange, but still nothing uh, in our pH and, and organic matter that's really making things great. But if you notice, the soil quality has gone to fair. We've moved from poor, poor, and now to fair. And now we go to 2022, and now our soil quality is excellent. Now our pH has moved into the right place, our percent of organic matter is 5.7, we're over the low of 5%, and our cation exchange is 10.5. But one more thing I wanna show you, on the bottom, you're gonna see the base saturation. This is very important when it comes to weeds. When we see a lot of weeds in our lawn, and even though some of us like them, we don't want those invasive ones that choke off some of our beneficial plants, that ratio, uh, the ideal range being 7.1 to 15.1 is really important when it comes to weeds. That's calcium to magnesium. They're both related. And so when you're thinking about liming and you just go to the hardware store and you buy a bag of lime and you don't know whether it's magnesium or calcium you need, you could be doing more harm to the lawn than good. You need to know whether we're low in calcium or low in magnesium and then make the right lime choice to make the right change in your pH. Very, very important. So that's that part there. I'm just gonna get my papers out of the way here and start to move along. But um, we can talk more about that in the question and answer period if you have it. Now I'd like to just talk about like what products we can use. So in a natural organic program, we're only using natural products. These are slow release fertilizers that take six to 10 weeks to fully deplete their, their resource. Uh, between applications, 
and there and we're looking at ingredients that we would recognize. Um, that's what this list is up here. That's going to be soybean. It's going to be humates, corn gluten, compost, worm castings, lime, alfalfa meal. These are all ingredients that we would recognize and say, oh, I know what that is, or I have an idea what that is. Um, so if you can't pronounce it, or if you can't spell it, or if you don't know what it is, most likely it's a synthetic. And if it's in synthetic, it's actually doing harm to our soil biology because in the talk we did in 2012, a long time ago, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the, the trickiness, the, uh, the slippery slope that the term organic is. And what that means is that organic, if you, by definition, means whatever it is has carbon in it. And there's so many things that are good that have carbon, like these items right here. But things like petroleum and salts are used in our fertilizers that also have carbon in them, and they're being sold as organic um, products. So we've got to be very careful to read labels when we, when we try to do a natural organic program. Just, so, just to give you a point of reference, I've, I've been a natural organic gardener since 1984, and, and that's a long time, and, and, I, and I realize all we're trying to do is we're trying to replicate what nature already does, and, and we'll talk a little more about that as well, but it just makes so much common sense to me. It's, it's not even... Um, it's not new and it's not different. Um, a lot of this stuff seems new to us because we've stepped away from it for a period of time, but it's actually going back to the way things always were before the 1950s and 60s when we started to introduce more chemicals. Um, the other thing with a natural organic program is the quality of the ingredients. You know, kelp and seaweed, these things are, are really important. Feather meal. Um, but you want to make sure that these products are USDA and OMRI approved. That's that is our um, that is our way of telling um, what what we have on our um, whether it's natural or if it's uh, synthetic. If OMRI is approving it, we know that it's going to be safe to use as homeowners. Same with USDA. Um, I think this is why we see organic uh, pro programs costing a little bit more. I think um, the ingredients are a little harder to harvest. They're a little harder to get. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's what we have. And um, the other last part of the fertilizer part is we do not recommend manures and sewage sludge products, synthetic or hybrids. And I'll tell you why. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I just want to just highlight this by saying, we talked about the soil test, um, which is our soil chemistry test. This soil biology test is really crucial that we don't disrupt it. It's already um, because a home has been built on our property, because someone might have used weed control or grub control or a fungicide, it's already compromised. So when we start to, to get in there and use products that have sewage sludge or synthetic, we're working backwards. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. Um, so let me see if I can get that slide up here, list of natural. Okay, so um, where can we get these products? Um, it's a couple of good references for you guys. Our Gardens Alive is a wonderful website. You can get lots of great stuff there. Russell's Garden Center in Wayland, Mass. is excellent as well. And um, North Country Organics is another one for a great resource for um, organic, uh, natural organic products. Again, read labels when you go to Russell's and Gardens Alive because they may be selling organic but not natural organic, but that'll make a big difference. Um, a question that's often asked um, is, is how long should it take to have a good lawn or a healthy lawn or, or a beautiful lawn? And, and this is where this unseen biology comes in. This is where um, when lawns have been mistreated, and by that I just mean the chemicals we talked about, fungicide, herbicide, pesticide, it kills off the microorganisms. They don't, they don't decipher or discern between what's a good organism and what's a bad one. They're just killing off organisms. And the other thing is compaction. You know, You have to think of it this way. A living organism needs oxygen. So in compacted soils, 
they can't survive. There's no oxygen. And so you'll see them depleted there. And then lastly, they call it excess tillage or construction. If, if we're rototilling every year, or if we're dethatching every year, or if we've got a backhoe digging out a foundation, um, you're gonna see a, a lot, if not all of the microbiology gone. It's just destroyed. It's either shredded, crushed, uh, suffocated or eliminated through these chemicals. And so most properties have had that. So when the foundation of your home was built, there was construction. So there was a lot of that microbiology that was removed. You may have uh, inherited a house that was a chemical lawn before. You may have a lawn that's got some compaction. You might park a car in, in an area, or you might've had construction where they stored you know, plywood and drove pickup trucks over. All those things need to be addressed. We need to now reinfuse our, our soils with the living organisms and their food sources so they can survive. And so um, a lot of people will say, well, how do I know? Like, like what do I do? So we, we measure, we measure soil biology. The microscope is a, a really effective way to see what's in your soil. So we take a small sample, we put it under a lens and we look at it. And if we can see lots of activity, nematodes, amoebas, ciliates, you'll see them darting across the slide. It's, it's actually very, very interesting. If not, we're gonna just see minerals. We're not gonna see any activity. Um, you can also send these tests off to um, expensive labs. I think the last time I priced out a soil biology test, it was over $300. And um, I'm not sure, I haven't priced one out in a few years since we bought this. But this has been a really good way of, of being able to sort it out. And this high powered microscope gives us a pretty good indication. It's kind of a, like we know, like if, for example, if you inherited a home that was a heavy chemical use home, you know you have an issue. But this verifies it. This tells us for sure and for certain. Um, so why is, why is soil biology so important? Um, and, um, and it's because if you look at our natural forest, the, the biome, it's never been disturbed and therefore it needs no fertilizer, no pesticides, no herbicides, no fungicides. Doesn't even need us to irrigate it, right? Nature does the work. Nature is our footprint. Nature is our way of um, trying to replicate and duplicate what we need to do in our gardens. So if we want to take our cues from anyone, I wouldn't take it from, from just anyone. I would take it for how nature works originally. And that's what we're trying to get back to. We're trying to restore soil and let the soil do the work. And as we get on in the program, we'll talk about how that limits the inputs that we're going to need to put in as well, because nature's doing most of the work. But we're just priming the pump at this point. Um, so when we feed the soil, the soil feeds the plant. That's kind of a good thing to think about. And what happens is it begins with what we call the soil food web. And that's this uh, diagram right here. It's really an interesting um, uh, sort of process of how the world beneath the soil is working. And so it all begins um, as, as the, um, the organic material we have in the ground is being broken down. These are beneficial fungi, beneficial bacteria, protozoa, amoebas, but not only that, it's birds, it's, it's small rodents on the top of the soil, breaking things down. And, and as, as the critters, these little microorganisms in the ground start chewing up and excreting out what they're eating in the soil, it's building healthy soil. And as long as we don't disrupt this soil food web, we should have very productive yield in whatever we're trying to grow, whether it's a vegetable garden or a lawn in this case, or shrubs or plants or flowers for that matter. Um, so as we do that, um, we're building you know, this healthy subsoil that allows us to have healthy grass. And I highly recommend at this point, um, so many people ask me, uh, what should I do? Like if I have some weeds, is it okay just to use an herbicide one time and then go back to the organic. And I use the example of taking, you know, one step forward, two steps back. So you start to put the organic material down and you're building soil, and then you go ahead and you put an herbicide down and you're back to where you started, if not further back. So I would definitely say not to sort of um, 
like commingle the programs, keep them separate. If you're going to do natural organic, keep everything natural and let those, you know, two, three, four, five years take place and see what happens. And that's how you get a real good test. If you do that, your recovery and, and the way the lawn responds is going to take a lot longer. Um, let me see where we're at here. So, um, so as we're trying to create this um, natural environment, we're going to naturally start to use less things. And, and this is how that works. So we get this soil test. It tells us we need to do a few things. We need to add some lime. We need to do this and that and the other thing. Once we've done it and we've kind of reached the area that we want to be, the zones that we want to be in, we don't have to do those anymore. But we do want to measure uh, to make sure that we're um, not slipping too far because soil declines over time. But occasionally I would do a soil test and then you do just a maintenance application. So you're not doing all that uh, high intense, uh, you know, sort of treatments as you were doing before. And um, I guess one of the ways we can do it is we can look at what a natural organic program looks like. And so if you were to just say, okay, Jim, what, what, what should I be doing? Like, how can I have this natural lawn and I want to do it myself or my garden is going to do it. We always fertilize three times a year with a slow release fertilizer, soy based for us. We use a soy based fertilizer um, and, and it's just a slow release and it's just slow and steady, very low. You know, it's a 606 or 636, very low in, in our nitrogen, very low in our phosphorus. And then this is an important part. So I hope I've encouraged you all to do a soil test. And if you do, you're going to see your phosphorus numbers in there in the chemistry test. If that phosphorus is like most tests that we do, it's off the charts. And, and unless you haven't been fertilizing, you know, if you've been using commercial fertilizer, that number is going to be really high. And, and phosphorus is not very helpful. One thing, it doesn't move very quickly in our soil. So we're just adding on top of it and on top of it. And what it actually does is it, it limits how iron and zinc, uh, you know, are in our soil. It, it, they, they become deficient. And it also reduces nutrient intake um, and, and, it, and it ruins our water quality. It creates these algal blooms in our ponds that kills off some valuable, you know, life in our, you know, ecosystem. So we want to be really careful of that. And they have some wonderful no phosphorus fertilizers. I highly recommend those. So read your soil test. And then when you do choose a fertilizer, choose one that's appropriate for what you're trying to do. Weed control, we use corn gluten meal. Um, and along with our seeding program, our seeding program is a like physical way of getting grass to choke out weeds. But corn gluten meal is a good way to suppress some weed seed. It's not super, super thorough, but it is, it is a good help. And it's a great uh, source of nitrogen as well. Uh, grub control, we use milky spore, nematodes, and cedar oil. All are good, but milky spore is specific to Japanese beetle grub. There are other types of grubs out there like European chafer that it doesn't work on. So you wanna be careful of that. So nematodes is, is a good source for that. It, it will, will, will uh, eliminate either or, but nematodes don't overwinter. So you've gotta constantly be redoing that. In cedar oil, we started using cedar oil a couple of years ago and it's been very helpful. Um, we've been able to control uh, grubs with that, and that can can eliminate them, whether they're chafer or Japanese beetle. Um, you also, in your program, you're going to defer to whatever your soil test recommends, right? So you'll you'll have your fertilizer, weed control, grub control, but now you may have um, a lime application, or you may have a granular compost application, or or whatever is recommended. So keep that in mind, and then. As you do that, I would couple a lot of that, um, the soil test recommendations with our fall aeration. And we also couple our uh, fall seeding program around that. So you can kind of um, take advantage of, of the work you're doing aerating and then add some beneficial services with it so you don't have to duplicate that. And, um, and that's really, uh, that's pretty cool. And so, um, this is another thing, you know, people say to me, um, what else do I need to do? And is there anything else I can do? And I just tell people, 
make sure you're looking around. This, this is the whole point of fall seeding right here. These bare spots that you're seeing are gonna be weeds next year. So this is a late summer uh, picture of a lawn that looks like it had some, you know, some sort of stress to it. And what we would do there is we would try to seed. So um, fall seeding is, is best because the weeds are not thriving. That's a big one. We don't have to you know, fight with weeds like we do in the spring. The ground is warm. So that means germination is very effective and efficient. It, grass comes in quickly. Um, and um, you know, we do have some rain and some cooler nights, which is very helpful on the water usage part of it as well. Um, I like I like to use this overseeding process, and we we do a couple of things with it. We'll do um, a a couple different types of seeding. We we do a top dressing overseeding. I'm going to go back because I want you to see something. We would top dress this big bare spot in here with. We would scarify the soil, uh, take a layer of good composted loam, and cover it and seed it. And in the thicker areas, we would be aerating and overseeding, so we're integrating into the older seed, new seed, so that we're thickening and, and uh, replenishing and, and rejuvenating the lawn that way. Um, a lot of times people will say that um, they don't know what kind of seeds to use. And I always tell them to use ones that are certified by NTAP, which is the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program. And, and there's, there's about four different types of grasses that we recommend. One is the turf type fescue. We use perennial rye, Kentucky blue, and fine fescue. I'm gonna just highlight these and just tell you a little bit about um, some of their benefits and some of their uh, weaknesses. But turf type tall fescue has been a grass seed that I've been using a lot lately and highly recommend it. It kind of covers um, a couple really key areas. It's drought tolerant, so it doesn't have a high water use. It can also be sun and shade tolerant, which is great. It germinates rather, rather quickly, 10 to 14 days, and it has a moderate fertilizer requirement. So um, I, I, like, I like that because I think we're, we're reducing our inputs naturally, right? We're not watering too much. We're not um, you know, having to fertilize too much. And then lastly, it handles foot traffic reasonably well. So it's not gonna disappear on us with a, a lot of foot traffic or a soccer game or whatever's going on in the yard. Um, perennial ryegrass is, is a good grass. Uh, both of these grasses, fescue and rye, are tufted grasses, meaning they have a single root system. They're not sideways rooted, so they don't hold on super, super well, but pretty well. Um, this one's a little less drought tolerant. It's a little better in the sun if you have a little more sun. But just keep in mind, my experience with this one is it's one of the first grasses to turn brown in the, in the summer when it gets warm. Not an issue for some people, but for some people it is. Germinates really quick, five to seven days. It needs just moderate fertilizer and it handles foot traffic pretty well. So that's not a bad grass. So if you did tall type fescue and perennial rye, I think um, you're being pretty, pretty sensible with your plan. Kentucky bluegrass, not drought tolerant, heavy, heavy water requirement. Very good in the sun, germinates in two to four weeks. That's a lot of establishment watering that's involved with that. High fertilizer requirement, but very, very good for traffic. This is the, the grass they use in sports fields, you know, football, soccer fields. It's stoloniferous. It has a root system that is sideways. So it grabs and holds and repairs itself. We stay away from Kentucky bluegrass because of the maintenance of it. If we do, it's a very small percentage of bluegrass in our mix, very, very small. And this one here, a lot of people have been talking about these fine fescues for a while. These are some of your low mow, no mow grasses, you know, the sort of the real low maintenance grasses. They're very drought tolerant. They're very shade tolerant. They germinate pretty quick, not too much fertilizer, but very poor for foot traffic. So for example, we did a lawn in Wellesley, oh gosh, it's gotta be about uh, 20 years ago. And we didn't know this and we were mowing like we normally did. And the grass came in beautiful. It was one of the nicest looking spots of grass that I've ever planted. And within two weeks, it was gone. It just, we mowed it twice and we, we killed it. We had to redo it. Um, so if you do have, if you do wanna use this, it needs to be more of a show lawn 
where you're just, just there to look at it. Like you don't have dogs, you don't have kids, uh, you don't use this part of the lawn and you don't mow it very often. You probably mow it two or three times a year maximum, but it is an option and it's something that you should be thinking of. Um, I did wanna talk briefly about um, spring seeding, just to give you some, some ideas on that. Um, sometimes you're, you're, in a, you're in a bad spot. You might've had a new water line or gas line put in or something happened to the lawn, plow damage, salt damage, and you don't wanna look at this all summer long. And um, there's a couple of challenges that come with um, spring seeded lawns. The first one is we're coming out of winter and the ground is really cold. And so germination is, is longer. It's, it's at least a week uh, to 10 days longer per, per duration, per germination um, time period. So by the time that grass comes in, a lot of our weed seed is starting to germinate. So now you've got this sort of co-mingling of good grass and, and, uh, and weeds, and um, sometimes the weeds overtake it. Uh, and then we have to get through a hot summer. And, and we in New England deal with cool season grasses. That's what allows us to get through our winters. Cool season grasses do not like the heat. And so that's why our grasses turn brown in the summer. And that's a good thing. Dormancy is a good thing. It's a way of taking the chlorophyll and all those uh, resources and ducking underground and, and putting themselves underground into the root system to protect themselves from the harsh part of the year. And then if you notice in the fall comes September and the cool weather, the cool nights, these grasses come back. And that's, that's what grass is supposed to do in New England. Um, but with um, spring seeded lawns, I don't think they even get through that period. Much of that disappears. So in the, in the event that you have one of these um, emergency situations, we recommend perennial ryegrass just as a crop cover, just so you can um, let the dog out or let the kids play in the backyard. But then I would reseed in earnest in the fall. I would use a good quality perennial ryegrass in the fall so that you're, you know, you're getting good long lasting turf. Um, so that's, that's that part of it. And um, I did wanna, I did wanna mention this to you guys, just we'll kind of take a breath here, but uh, these natural organic programs are slow to react. So being proactive um, gives us the greatest chance of achieving whatever your expectations are. So that's where the seeding comes in. So um, I can tell you what we do for 90% of our clients is we overseed. And it's, it's, it's not because um, you know, we wanna you know, make our bank accounts bigger. It's because we're, we're losing ground in a natural organic program if we don't do it. We'll have bare spots, we'll have more weeds. And then the next thing we have is we have like a situation where we need to renovate a a large part of the yard, which is very, very expensive. So we'd rather just incrementally be uh, enhancing the lawn so that we eliminate some of the weed problems, we eliminate the erosion problems, and we don't have this major expense at the other end. And so that's why we do that. Um, these are the processes that you know we would do, like we talked a little bit about the top dressing, that's adding soil, aeration overseeding, lawn renovation, which is when we take all the grass out and we start over, sodding and slice seeding. There's also um, another one too, which is hydro seeding, which we don't do a lot of. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. But here's a lawn renovation. This is a home that we work on. Um, it had some major problems with the grass. So we, we removed it all and uh, put in the right soils, did soil testing, put the right during the course of that summer, we were adding the things that it needed in terms of what the soil test was recommending in the spring. This is ready to, to grass seed. And so um, what happened was, um, you know, it, it, it you know, we watered and so forth. And I'll explain a little bit about that watering. Watering is gonna be really important, but I don't like to waste resources, probably like many of you, we're not looking to water for the sake of watering, but we're, we want to water to, to keep our plants alive and healthy. And so um, a lot of folks will say to me, um, I don't want to waste it. So how do I know how much to put down? And so what I tell people is, is to in, either invest in a rain gauge or put out a mason jar or a tuna fish can or whatever you have. 
and run whatever mechanism of watering you have, whether it's a hose with a store-bought sprinkler or a fancy sprinkler in-ground sprinkler system, run it for a period of time, a half hour, an hour, whatever it is, it's reasonable to, to accumulate some, some depth and realize that you're gonna need one inch of water per week. That's, that's sustainability. That's just sustaining your garden. Um, and that's, you don't have to do that in May and April when we're getting plenty of rain, but I would say maybe the latter half of June and July and August, I'd be very, I'd be, I'd have a, I'd have something out all the time and I'd be measuring the natural rainfall. And if we got a half an inch of rain, I'd give a half an inch of water. You know, I'd kind of respond that way, like be sensible that way. But if you don't measure it, we're wasting. We don't want to waste, uh, but we do want to make sure that you know, our plants, which are living organisms survive. And, um, and unfortunately, they're, they're, they're not like silk plants, they don't survive, no matter what we do have to do certain things to keep them alive. And you just want to make sure that you understand that. And I don't recommend watering every day either. I recommend maybe two or three times a week if you need to. And deeper waterings, not not shallow, like 10 minutes a day every day, I would do maybe whatever, whatever the, the timing tells you, but half hour, three times a day, half hour, twice a week, something like that to get an effective drink of water down to your plants. Um, I just, uh, I, you know, I feel like there's a couple of things too to mention with watering. When you're watering, um, a lot's gonna depend on the kind of soil you have. So as you're doing your compaction test, as you're looking around and looking at the terrain that you have, it's gonna give you some clues as to how often to water and, and, and not waste it. Because what we don't wanna see happen is, say you have a sloped front lawn and you put it on for the half hour and, and it just really runs off. It, most of it's gonna run off. And so that's kind of wasting the water that way because the plant isn't getting it. And do what we talked about before, maybe just give it incremental waterings, maybe two or three times you know, for five minutes or whatever it is, just so it can absorb it. That's important. Um, as we move forward, this is that lawn that I was uh, showing you earlier. This is uh, four weeks later. Um, we've mowed it. Here's a couple of helpful hints, I hope. Um, when we mowed it, we've turned off the sprinkler system for two days. We wanted to dry the lawn out a little bit before we mow it. We don't want to, you know, when it's wet and heavy, it's sort of uh, leaning over, it's not cutting well. We wanna be real careful in the first couple mows. This lawn here, we use a very big machine, a 52 inch stand-on machine. We used a walk behind mower. You can see the tire tracks are very close together. We would never put a heavy machine on newly seated lawn like that. You gotta be real careful. And we use a bag attachment so that we're not leaving wet clumps. This, this, this lawn is full of water because it's been watered so much. Those blades of grass are heavy. Once you leave them, they're gonna turn brown and they're gonna stain and they're gonna, it's gonna be a, a, an issue. So you wanna clean those up the first few mows until you get it right. And um, you know, when you think about your lawn and what you wanna do, um, you're gonna have your expectations in place. And I think this is the most important thing. This lawn looks like a sod lawn. It's just because it just came in. We've, we've worked for this family for 30 years and, and this is a 10 year old picture. It doesn't look like that anymore. It's got weeds in it. It's, it's a natural lawn. They're very natural people. We don't put any chemicals there, but it came in well. And, and if you want a lawn like this, you can overseed to your heart's content. If you want a more reasonable representation of what a lawn is, which is a green living organism that you can walk and play on and, and use, um, then that 70-30 rule really applies where you have about 70% grass and about 30% weeds, and it can be, really be a, a good thing. And so um, I did have one thing I added to the program because I just, I just wanted to kind of tie in the financial part a little bit. So I did a little research recently on just um, the average cost of lawn care programs, because a lot of people would say, you know, that a lot of people think organic is more expensive and, and it is because of the inputs. Like if you do a soil test and you do uh, all the extra things, it is. But it does, it does have this sort of uh, way of giving back. As you correct it, nature kicks in and starts to do more of the work. And it's actually much more closely tied in price to a, a synthetic program. And here's, here's some numbers. So I went on a, 
a website called House Method, which is a, an unbiased review, so to speak, on uh, for homeowners. Okay, and they say that the average cost of lawn care for a 10,000 square foot property is about $150 a month. That's a chemical program. So I went ahead and I looked at my properties that I have and, and that are 10,000 square feet. And that came out to $199, uh, so call it 200. So about $50 a month more for an organic. But that's an organic program that's new, that has um, you know, grub control, weed control, aeration. Uh, that's a full program. Um, aeration, for example, they're telling us the cost is $125. Ours is about the same. We were very close. I think we were a little bit less for ours. Weed control is $85 for the chemical. It's $140 for the organic. And the reason why that is, is the organic pro pro product is very expensive. The corn gluten meal only covers 2,500 square feet. So we needed four bags of it. Uh, and, and that's why the price is a little higher. So it's the material. Grub control, uh, $80 for the chemical, $84 for the natural. Um, and um, none of these had any soil test recommendations. Those would be over and above those prices just to give you some, some reference point. The things that are gonna determine cost in my opinion are the location, like where the property is located and I don't mean like the wealthy part of town or not. I mean, where it's located in proximity to where you have to drive, whether you have clients there, um, those types of things. The type of grass, remember we talked a little bit about uh, bluegrass being a high maintenance grass versus the tall type fescues will make a difference in the cost of the program. The size of the property, the bigger the property, the more material, the more labor. The quality of materials is huge. Um, you really need to read the labels because um, if any of you shop at some of the, uh, the, the stores that sell you know, natural organic things, we pay a little bit more for those. Um, and, um, and, and it's for, for some good reasons. One is they don't, they don't make a lot of it, right? The economies of scale are there in you know, chemical fertilizers are mass produced where organic isn't quite as, you know, it's not there yet. It's not as uh, big of a deal. Um, and then the last thing is the expertise of the people doing it. You just wanna make sure you have someone who understands what they're doing and, and knows what they're doing. And I, um, you know, in conclusion, I just feel like an organic program has a lot of benefits, many, many benefits. And most importantly, um, keeps our families safe. It keeps uh, our, our environment safe. It uh, preserves that soil biome that we talked about, that soil biology, protects our environment. And, you know, we all, we're all here as stewards to take care of it. So we need to do as we're called our part. And I feel like when you do an organic, nat natural organic program, you're really doing a noble thing. You're doing a good thing. And then natural organic uh, lawns uh, don't come without challenges. You know, weather challenges, you know, too much rain, not enough rain, hot summers, not so hot summers, droughty summers. So just know that there are some challenges and some years are better than others. The results are better than others. But I can tell you after almost 40 years that they come around. I mean, we've got clients we've had for 35 years um, and we do very little there. We fertilize, we mow, um, some of them have irrigation, some of them don't. Sometimes we'll seed there. We have a couple that have some overactive uh, terriers that want to tear up the lawn and, and so we seed, but it really does get reduced over time. Um, and remember that, that they're slow to affect change. So you know, make sure you're, you're being proactive and doing the things you um, feel that are important, like the overseeding, the grub controls, those types of things. And, you know, um, lastly, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to, to share with you something that means a lot to me. It's something I've uh, put a lot of time into in my life. And uh, it's, uh, just it's nice that people care to listen to it. And I hope um, what we've talked about has some benefit to you. So thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Jim, does the, do the cost decrease over time on the organic, using the organic uh, methods? They do. Um, and it's, it's, it's different for everyone. Um, remember, we looked at those soil tests and we saw there was a four year span before the soil turned around. So sometimes there's a heavier upfront cost with organic. 
But then once you reach that, you go right down to the base program where you're just fertilizing. I have a couple of clients that I just fertilize for. I don't do any grub control, any weed control. And sometimes I don't even seed for them. They have a very different expectation. So it really, it really depends too on what's important to you. Um, I have, uh, I, met a, I met a client on the phone today who told me uh, she lives in Lexington that she planted an all, she had a company come out last fall and plant a clover lawn for her. And I've been very interested in that because I've had um, mixed results with that. I found that clover lawns haven't, uh, uh, they sort of disappear in the winter. So it's just like bare soil. And I'm nervous about that for a lot of reasons. Uh, mostly uh, erosion issues that are hard to, 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 to keep a track of. And she said she had no lawn anymore. She was afraid that it died. And so when you talk about an organic lawn, you, you can um, definitely can reduce the costs based on longevity. The longer you go with it, the less you do. Um, but the most important thing is you can start integrating um, different techniques into it to even reduce it even more. Like some people will reduce the size of their lawn they, you know, over time. So they're not dealing with a lot of turf. Others are integrating things like clover and other weed seeds into their lawns so that it's not as fussed over, you know, and then it just sort of reduces it. But we still have this safe um, environment to live in, which I think is ultimately what we're trying to create. And the difference is some people want their lawns to resemble, um, we'll just say golf, of course, for lack of a better term. And other people aren't as particular and prefer uh, a more natural, diverse body of plant material. So that also comes into play, not only just the cost of what we do, but the expectation that goes with it. All right, we have some questions from the audience. Um, first question is, can you aerate lawn manually or do you have to have a machine? That's a great question. And um, when you aerate manually, you're using most likely a spike, some sort of a probe that goes into the ground and makes a hole, but it only compacts the soil surrounding it. So like sometimes they'll use a spiked shoe, sometimes they'll use a roller with spikes. That just creates more compaction because if you think about it, the coring machine actually relieves the soil of its tension by pulling out a plug and that allows it to loosen up. And when you put a probe in, you just force the compaction to all sides of the, um, the probe going in. So I don't recommend that. Um, I know it's a little easier for a homeowner to do that, but it's actually creating the problem. You wanna be careful of that. Um, another, uh, another person said, we have um, Arba Vita trees and they have suffered from the drought last year and turned brown. Will they come back? In my experience, arbovitae have been uh, very slow to respond. They're like a world needled evergreen. They sort of, they're not like uh, a yew, which can regenerate itself very quickly. In my, my experience, when they've become wind burned or they've become affected by drought, um, they do not come back. Is there anything that they, that they can do? Um, do they just have to replace it? Well, if it's, if it's all brown, like it almost looks like a rust color brown, then re and it's you know 80, 90 percent of the plant, then replacing is what it is. If it's just brown tips on on the, the world needles, then you may want to try fertilizing. But you want to be careful because selecting the fertilizer um, is really important. If you have a fertilizer, we use a I'll, I'll tell you what we use so you have an idea. There's a product called Roots, R-O-O-T-S, and it's a biostimulant, and it's a, it's a root developer is what it is, and um, that's what you need to do. You need to get those feeder roots uh, to regenerate so they can take in water and nutrients better. Um, a lot of times, too, when, when you have an arbovitae or any plant like that that turns brown, you need to know what caused it. Um, sometimes we use fertilizers that have salts in them that can create a problem. Sometimes they're close to a busy road where the plow and the salt from the winter does the damage. Other times it's a root ball that's been affected during transport um, where um, it's been dried out in a truck. You know, some of these tractor trailers 
might have a, a Friday pickup and then they deliver on Monday and the plant's been sitting in a hot um, container for, for three or four days, that can be a problem. There's a lot of different reasons why they, they do that. Um, and then there's also winter burn, which is when the ground freezes and the roots are locked in and the air temperature gets above 40 degrees and our needles start to transpire moisture, that's when you see um, the plant dry out. It call, it's called desiccation. And so you want to you wanna figure out what caused it and that'll help you figure out whether you have a chance to, um, to bring it back. Okay, someone else said, great presentation. I need to earn my green thumb credentials because your photographs make me dream of what my home can be one, become one day. Thank you. Very sweet. Thank you. So um, with regard to the lawn, how long did it take to, to get a lawn that green? Uh, and, and I mean, what, is, what, is, what are realistic expectations? Well, no, this is a, this, the one that's the picture you're looking at is a brand new lawn. So that took four weeks to come in, right? And so, but the, the, that's the good news. The bad news is it can only decline from there. It, it, the lawns never stay at 100%. Even a sod lawn gets worse over time. But that's not a bad thing. We want diversity in the lawn. As an organic gardener, as an organic lawn care provider, I'm, I'm not striving for this. This just happens to be because it's fresh and it just started and they watered very well. They did a good job watering. But I would say two things. The soil test will tell you a lot. If the soil says poor, like the one that we looked at, then you know you're in for at least a four to five year turnaround because we can't support good grass if our soil profile beneath it isn't healthy. We've got to get that right before we can really start to invest good money into a good result, if that makes sense. And then in other cases, we've inherited lawns that if they start out either fair or, or good, and it's a like a year or two and they're, they're right up and running. And we've had both. It just depends. This family that we're looking at here, they're, they've been organic all along. So there was very little transition. I've had, I had another lady who we inherited a lawn for 30 years. They had a, a chemical treatment on this lawn. It took us about seven years to turn it around. We did, but it took a little bit more persistence. And then we've had clients that have done nothing for many, many years. They don't, they don't know what to use. They just don't do anything. And those lawns are very easy to renovate and bring around. They have the soil biologies in place. Tim, do you believe that the using chemicals on the lawns um, like Roundup or Dicamba or, or, um, or 2,4-D or something similar, or any type of herbicide are damaging to the lawns and why? Well, you know, it, it's, it's not my, my area of expertise, but I can tell you one thing. Um, I believe um, that, that they're working against what we're talking about because those products um, eliminate and kill off soil biology. We know that, that's, that's a known fact. And so um, I feel like it's not working in the direction we wanna go. Um, in general, we wanna do no harm I know it's, it sounds um, uh, a, a little idealistic, but it's true. We don't want to um, do something bad to do something good, if you know what I'm trying to say. So I feel like you can, I, I think when I talk to a client, I always tell them in my first meeting with them to expect some weeds, just expect them. It just, you know, this realistic expectation um, we can't, we can't deliver a perfect turf organically. It's, it's, it's just not possible, but, um, like the picture that we, we looked at, I don't know if I can pull it up real quick. Um, this has been, this one here has been an organic lawn for 17 years. I, I just think it looks amazing to me. That That's the kind of grass I want to sit in and have a picnic or whatever. And um, it's just it's just a beautiful lawn. And um, there's, there's never been one chemical on that lawn. And it, I know the history of that lawn because the people before had chemicals. And this area in the middle was a, a septic system. Remember we talked a little bit about um, how the weeds are indicators. Well, crabgrass likes dry conditions, septic systems drain well, there's a lot of sand in there. 
And so that middle was 100% crabgrass for five years, not anymore. It has some, it'll have some, but not like it was before. And it's all because we do some annual seeding there. We've gotten the soil right. Um, they, this family irrigates judiciously. They don't overdo it. They don't underdo it. And, um, and, and that, that's their expectation. That's what they want. And so we've been very fortunate to be able to do that. But that's, that's 15 years of work. And I would say about, um, it took probably six years to get the soil biology back. So Jim, you, have some, you have some local ties. Do you want to tell how you, uh, what your local ties are to Watertown? Yeah, you know, I, I grew up in Brighton. Um, so I know, uh, I know Watertown very well. I have family that lives in Watertown and uh, I had many friends from Watertown growing up. Um, I um, have serviced that town before. My, you know, my company did work in Watertown. Um, and so um, currently our shop now used to be, our shop was in Waltham for many years and, and they sold that property. So we moved out to uh, West Concord. Uh, but we still we still come into Belmont and Watertown and Lexington and those towns, and um, you know we find that uh, you know, there's a lot of people in these towns that uh, like Lexington and Watertown that really care about the environment, and so it's been a good fit. And you know I've known you two now for I don't know better part of almost 15 years. I can't even remember, I can't even recall, but we've known each other for a long time. And there's some some real good good folks in 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 Watertown trying to make a difference. And so, um, Watertown has been uh, a town that's really been responsive when it comes to uh, um, you know doing things the right way. And I think it'll go further. I think it can even go further. But I think it's going well. Another question um, uh, from the audience. Um, I'm in a condo, and the fertilizer guy has has to put up danger flags not to walk on grass. I've asked them what they use and they say it's safe, but it kills my perennials in my beds. How do I get a straight answer? Hmm. Well, um, there, there are product labels um, that you could probably request. Um, oftentimes when we do an estimate for a condo, we have to provide um, labels uh, that, of what we're applying, even though it's organic. They just wanna know what we're applying because people have questions. So I certainly would do that. That would be the place I would start and get a um, ingredients label and find out what, what they're using. And then you can take it from there. What about a material safety data sheet? Do you yeah. know you're familiar with that? Yeah. You can describe what that is. Yeah, um, you know, that's gonna give you the information on, on what, what's harmful, uh, what the proper storage and uses are of it, um, what the applications are for it. And uh, it's something that I think you would benefit, you know, to have, you know, especially for folks that have allergies or may have a loved one or a pet that's susceptible or sensitive to things. Um, I honestly have not been super familiar with a lot of the chemicals that are out there now. Um, only I, I mainly focus on the organic. I don't focus on the chemicals, but um, these product labels are very uh, informative. And if you need to look at um, the hazards on them, right? There'll be warnings on these things and they'll tell you what some of the, the side effects and some of the, the potential hazards are. But I don't deal a lot with it though, Deb. I, I wish I, you know, I haven't seen one recently. I know ours, the ones that we use and there, you know, tells you the ingredients. It tells you what it's used for. Um, it tells you about application rates and things like that. And so, but I certainly would, um, would feel very, you know, if I were this person, I would feel very comfortable asking for this data sheet so that they could, you know, at least be aware of what it is in case there's a potential harm there. Okay, Jim, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your, your presentation uh, in part of the, the first session of our series on uh, organic landscaping. Uh, we will be having a, uh, the second part will be uh, Denise Brockenrecker from the Mass Water Resources Authority. She authored a book uh, about um, a healthy environment begins at home, and it's uh, it's free on the MWRA website. And uh, uh, there's a spy if you want to get. They, they, I think they may have some spiral books left. Uh, it's an excellent resource of what you can do inside and outside your home, and she's full of uh, information. So please come next uh, next month, 
and please uh, watch all of the series. Uh, it's going to be an excellent series with a lot of information uh, to help you, uh, you know, uh, you know care for your um, your grass and the inside of your home and outside um, going forward. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Jim, for uh, for giving the presentation. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.